So welcome to your practice, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you the day before Thanksgiving. Um, just practicing together and, and holding space together. So I'm gonna invite you today to start on your back with a little something under your head. Since you're at home, that something could be a couple paperback books, um, a small blanket, preferably not a squishy pillow, just something that's gonna allow your head to have some rollability on the ground. And then we'll recline onto the back. to arrive for our practice and to take a few moments to get settled. So even though it's morning, sometimes some of our muscles are tired or overworking, maybe from how we slept or just habitual habits of posture. Um, so, let yourself be supported. It might be that you take a few moments just to be almost in Shavasana pose with the arms and legs extended. And you could scan through and notice what in me wants to let go the most when I um, arrive here. And then, you know, as we spend a couple minutes here, you might then bend your knees and bring your feet to the ground or hands on the belly. And then you might look around your space a little bit, letting your eyes be free. So the eyes, the eyeballs and the sockets, they can get tense and so, just by looking around with curiosity to see what's in the space around you, even, even though you know what's in the space around you most likely, um, just seeing the colors and the lights, see what catches your eye. And then you might look up above you towards the ceiling and just let the image of the ceiling drop into your eyes. So that's different than your eyes having to push out to see as they often do maybe on a screen um, or a recipe book as the case may be, any um, activity where we're doing a lot, such as cooking, computing, gardening. And then lastly, with the visual field, can you um, let whatever you see above you drop into your eyes? And then can you also, while maintaining that focus, become aware of your peripheral vision? So there's something far off to the right and to the left. Um, and that's a bigger visual field than the pointed focus on the ceiling above you. So what is that like to bring space there? And then you could think of there being, even though you can't see it, you can think of there being space above your head, to your right and to your left, that, that you could see your space in front of you. And then there's even space behind you, the, the ground literally, but also, um, you know, going deeper than the floor that you're resting on, there's space. We get boxed up um, in our conception of space. And so just this uh, idea of, of creating more space around us can create more space internally. See if that's true for you. And then while we're fine tuning or opening our awareness, um, we're leaving ourselves alone, which is, this is the Alexander Technique practice of constructive rest that we're doing at the beginning. Um, and it frees all the joints, it frees the, the spine into support, but it just gives us a chance also to practice non-doing. Um, it's almost like, I feel like life, if we were watching a film, sort of goes at the, the, either the pace of the film itself or it's on fast forward. 
so that everything's going really fast. And um, this lens of mindfulness, somatic mindfulness that we can put on our practice is putting it in slow, putting that film in slow motion so that um, things that you might not have discovered in the fast pace may become known to you, um, such as, oh, I didn't know that I just have this habit of, um, uh, you know, when I think about my work, I, I clench my, my shoulder or my right sacrum, um, just little, little pieces like that. They might not even be that direct, um, might become available to you when we take the time to slow down. I'm gonna sit up to keep talking to you, but we'll spend a couple more minutes here. So you might think of your facial mask softening, this whole you know, area of the face, and that the jaw is separate from the rest of the head, that the lower jaw here can um, just slightly, might not even open, but just this idea that it's not clamping up into the rest of your head. And then your head delicately sits on top of your spine on the narrowest part of the spine, the neck. Um, and so that place is uh, higher than you think. It's sort of around the corner from the ear holes. So just thinking of there being ease of the head neck connection. So there's that spot. And then the area behind your eyes is the center of balance for the head. So the head is sort of always nodding forward and then just bobbling on top of the spinal column. It, but because the weight is forward, it, it sort of is, it, it's designed to nod. And then we, there's a writing reflex that um, keeps us from having our head fall forward. Like when you're um, dozing off in the car or something, you've probably caught yourself with your head dropping forward because it's weighted that way. So we're just all these things we're thinking about during our constructive rest today are designed to just keep renewing that head balance. Almost like the spinal column is a fountain and the head is free to be on top. And then you can have this idea that the pelvic bowl is grounded and resting on the ground at the other end of the spine. The hands and feet are empty, not clenched. And then we won't devote as much time to it right now, but there can be an idea that the shoulders and elbows and wrists are, are available to you rather than pulling in or clenching. Um, and the hips, knees, and ankles are also free. But we'll give a little more time to those joints to unwind a bit as we practice. The constructive rest is sort of like a check-in with yourself and just a little reboot of all the circuitry um, in your system. Can your breath come and go with a sense of ease? And is it easier to breathe? It might not be, but it, it might it might be because you've um, just created more space. And then if you'd like to now, you can set an intention for your practice today, a theme or quality that resonates with you. See what comes to mind or given the 
the holiday that's upon us, it, it might be um, something you're grateful for. Or just this idea of gratitude in general. Um, and when that feels complete for you, we'll begin with just a little movement here. So maybe gathering the knees towards you. Can you keep your shoulders wide? That's just like you're forming a, uh, your arms are curving around an imaginary ball that happens to include your knees under your hands. And we're just rocking the head and pelvis from side to side, which then invites the rib cage to roll as well. And so you might not roll that much. Um, to roll more would probably involve more muscular effort of pulling in or um, just efforting more. So see if you can find this rollability and we'll change it now, hands on the kneecaps. If you hug your right knee towards you and start to look to the right, momentum should just take you onto your right side. It's almost like you're just falling onto your right. And then if you hug your left knee towards you and start to look to the left, might take a moment, but then you'll start to roll in that direction. So see if you can take a couple passes <clears throat> at that. I just find when I hug the one knee towards me that I want to, of the side that I want to roll towards, um, it just helps the weight shift. And you might feel a few little pops or releases because um, usually we would sort of, uh, in my experience, I find that we would, um, instead of rolling to the side, like if you were asleep in bed and you wanted to flip over, we literally like flip ourselves like a pancake. There's a lot of muscular tension that might be gathered in the front body um, to do that. So we're just trying to really drop into the back and you could just play with the movement now, rolling from side to side, maybe sweeping the arms overhead. It's the same principle of momentum. And as always, there's a temptation to go faster, which might feel good in your body, but you can always come back to the slow base. And and then we'll pause, pressing the feet into the ground and elevating the pelvis just into a brief bridge pose. And then we'll press the feet again and lift into bridge, just noticing how your feet can hold weight there. Um, and then last time, as you press into the feet, the, um, the glutes and a, a lot of these pelvic muscles activate sort of diagonal from your sacrum all the way to the side of your leg and on out. Um, see if you can feel that engagement rather than an engagement in the front here. And then we'll just let that go for a moment. Taking the few seconds here to integrate. Integrate what we've just done. And so now you're welcome to flip your legs up and come up to a seat or maybe just roll to the side and we'll come up to a seated position, elevating <clears throat> your pelvis on some props if they're available to you. Even if you're flexible, it's nice to have the hips higher than the knees. So you can crisscross your legs or maybe bring them into a diamond shape if that would be better. Whatever would feel nice for your hip. And some, some people like to put something underneath the knees or the thighs there. And so take a moment to really let the sacrum, the back of your pelvis just drop um, into the back of the pelvic bowl. You're not leaning backwards, but you are really in the support of your own back. And then correspondingly, we can think of the pubic bone in the front of the pelvis um, as conducting weight from the front body. So, so the spinal weight comes down um, through the pubic bone and through the front of the legs, but it also comes down through the back, through the sacrum, through the back of the legs. And we'll look at that more in standing in a moment. But from here, see if you can shift now to one sitting bone. 
So it's like you're rolling, you could even use your hands to help the pelvic bowl like we did on the back, but now you're bouncing from one sitting bone to the other. So the one that lifts in the air isn't because you're picking it up, it's because the whole bowl has tilted to the side. And this is just a way of weighting ourselves reflexively down through the sitting bones. Um, and then I don't know if you have room on your, how, whatever you're sitting on, but if you do, um, you could walk each half of your pelvis forward one step, one, two, and then walk each sitting bone back one step. So the sitting bones become like feet. When we're sitting, they conduct weight down. Good. Head is floating on top of the spine. Let's look to the left. I'm gonna to try to mirror you. <clears throat> and when you look left, part of your head has to go right in order for this ball to stay on top of your spine. And then we'll look in the other direction. Back of the head goes one way to counterbalance <clears throat> the face going the other way. And then just find that little nod, which is really um, a lot higher, as I was mentioning. Notice how yes can happen. So if I wanted to look down or I wanted to look up, that could happen from a higher place on my spine without compromising the neck or the shoulders. Let's just bring the hands loosely together now and we'll um, just wake up the wrists by rolling through the wrists. And then we'll release very gently, elevate your shoulders towards the ears, but then don't smush them down. Just let them sort of land like scaffolding over top of the rib cage. Elbows are free. And then we'll just very gently elevate the shoulders to get the length of the side bodies. And then let them just land without smushing them down. Elbows and shoulders are wide. Let's um, now take the left hand as if you wanna offer something out to some, someone in front of you. And then we're gonna take the um, hand back to the lap. Let's um, change that now diagonally. We're gonna slide the left hand along the thigh and then offer something out. And then your forearm has to swivel in order to come back. So we'll do that motion. You could keep it low on your own lap or begin to float out through the fingertips. And then one of these next times, you're gonna float up and overhead. And so the pinky finger is coming more in so that you get this wrap of the arm. And then we'll take a little side bend over to the right. But don't side bend if that feels like too much. And then we'll come up and out. Fingertips are lively, like they're shooting little energy sparks and we're gonna float the arm out. Good, so I can just tell by looking at myself that this shoulder that we just worked on, this whole side actually feels taller um, and more full. I don't know if you can see that or maybe you feel that in yourself and then we'll play with the other side. So first, just this idea of making an offering and then the elbow bends to bring that hand, that whole arm back. And then sliding the hand along the leg. And then returning. So the arm is making this motion, but then there's other pieces involved from the back, even the eyes are looking. <clears throat> and then you can go up to come up and over to your left. Jaw is still free compared to the rest of the head. It's free of the rest of the head, not clamping up. And then we'll swan dive the arm out to the side and just take a moment to um, Notice, notice how that lands for you.
So now we'll combine a couple of those things. We'll look to the left. So the head has the swivel on top of the spine and then we'll invite the rib cage to turn um, <clears throat> as well. And notice how your right hip sort of comes forward, left hip goes back. Uh, it's, not, it's not a big movement, but there is a shift of the pelvic bowl slightly so that you can do the seated twist. And then we'll spiral around, oops, to the other side. And now the left hip comes forward, right hip goes back a little bit uh, as everything above also spins. So we want the legs and the pelvis to be a ground or a foundation for what the upper body is doing. Rather than just wrenching the shoulders around, we want everything below it to be um, helping or supporting rather. Good, and then we'll release. Let's take the backs of the hands now to the sacrum, the back wall of your pelvis. And if the tendency is to sort of lean forward in your seat, you'll feel that you, your sacrum wants to pull away as you overarch your low back. See what it's like to really, um, your hands are firmly pressing, like I guess towards the, in front of you and your sacrum is dropping back to meet that pressure from the hands. And then we'll trace the latissimus dorsi musculature here up through the armpits, give a little squeeze at the trapezius here on top of the shoulders, and then come up through the occipital ridge of the head, floating the arms up, and then coming down. And then you can repeat that a couple of times, hands meet the sacrum, we'll come up through the side, squeeze the trapezius, trace it up to the occipital ridge, and then send the energy up and out. Last time, back of the hands to the sacrum. Occipital ridge, and then coming down. So one last thing here before we get moving a little bit more, let's shift um, into the Let's see the right one. No, let's do left first. Let's shift into the left sitting bone. Um, you can choose. <laughs> and um, we're gonna just let the elbow of um, the opposite side float up so that you're reaching. So it's almost like I'm leaning on this um, thigh. And then the right hand is reaching up just to open this whole area. There's something on above me that I wanna just sort of get. And then very carefully returning. I'm just noticing the length on this side now. And now we'll go to the other side, forearm to the thigh, or you don't have to go that low, your hand could just sit there. And then we're gonna to try to um, dangle or lengthen the elbow. So it's from the ribs to the elbow. And then see what hand position works best for you. Your, your hand and forearm don't need to be um, tense. They're just sort of dangling here. Maybe you'll extend the lower arm to get that thing on the ceiling above you, but we're just trying to clarify the use of the arm from the elbow to the back. Um, often that gets a little mangled or disorganized and then the hand tries to go for it. Um, but we want the hand and wrist to have support here. This other side is going down. So I go down through the um, right side in order for the left to go up. And then we'll release that side. And just take a moment. Sometimes you, you might feel a little tingly in the arms because we that sort of changes how the um, collarbones, Um, the space around the collarbones where um, underneath there a lot of nerves conduct. So just give yourself a moment to regroup if needed and we'll come forward onto the hands and knees now. You're welcome to put a blanket under your knees if that would be useful. And, um, and let's actually just start on the knees. So as you stand here on your knees with your knees uh, parted about hip width, this is a good place to think about the head floating on top of the spine, the spinal column drops down into this, um, the sacrum is like a keystone in the back of the pelvis, just waiting or 
um, yeah, conducting weight through the pelvis and into the legs. And then remember there's this um, sense of conducting weight through the front, through the pubic nerve or the pubic disc. So we're just streaming all that energy. And now I'll see if you can sort of like a seesaw or mm, I guess a drawbridge. We're gonna just send, send the pubic bone back so that you draw a bridge down without straining your neck or chin. So it's a head pelvis counterbalance. And then that should put you in a nice long table. Press the ground away and invite your shoulders to be wide once again, rather than straining in some way. And um, let's, let's take the left hand and the right knee off the ground slightly, which will make you asymmetrical. It just turns on some deep postural muscles there. And then we'll switch so right hand and left knee come off the ground. That which remains on the ground pushes the ground away. Good, and then we'll release, swaying the hips from side to side. And then let's sway the hips. Let's see, we'll go left. And then we're gonna dome the spine like a cat stretching, shift to the right. And then look out into the room, cow pose, shifting back to the left. So that's sort of a big cat cow circle that I hopped into. Um, feel free to play with that or just if that was too much of a hop, just do cat cow for a few moments and then see if you wanna add a little circling of the pelvis within the cat cow. Depending on your habits of use and how you sit and so forth, one half of the circle is probably not getting as much um, free movement in everyday activity. So, um, and that would be true of the spinal movements too. You know, maybe cat seems more familiar and cow less so. So we're just trying to invite a little balance. You don't have to overthink it <laughs> too much. Let's widen the knees now and sit back on the, the feet if that's comfortable for you. And then you'll be on your forearms here in the front. You can be on your forearms or your hands, but make sure the hands are wide to accommodate the width of the shoulders. <clears throat> Either way, uh, either isometrically slide your hands forward or your forearms forward. So um, it's like you're trying to slide for, the isometric is that you're trying to slide forward against the mat, but you don't really move in space. It's just an engagement in that direction. Um, so as once you've isometrically engaged, notice what that's like. And then you might add a little cat cow, whatever shape you're doing there, just isolates a different part of the spine than, than we had in table pose. So when I'm on my forearms, I really, I guess either way, hands, or forearms. In this position, I really feel my um, upper back getting some movement that usually might not be available there. But there's subtle differences between um, the two positions. So I'll let you observe that. And then we will drop the forearms down if they're not already so. And what would it mean just to take your hands and let your head, forehead rest in your cupped hands while letting your shoulder blades go down your back? You could also play with a little bit of change, letting your chin rest, but still nodding the head forward. I'm just playing around with different <laughs> ways to support a release in the neck and jaw muscles. This one feels nice. I took my elbows a little wider. It's almost like being on a massage table face down or something <laughs> with the forehead pressing into the hands. But the, this 
trapezius is widening and the shoulder blades are dropping down the back. That feels nice. Maybe one more um, invitation for the jaw to release away from the rest of the head. And then see if here you can think of your um, pelvis being a little bouncy. And in a moment, you're just gonna bounce back up to table, but that comes from some support below. Curling the left toes under when you're ready, extending the leg back, opening the heart. And then can you still have a sense of where your midline is rather than having shifted all the way to the right? Good, and then we'll drop that knee and extend the right leg long, pushing out. This time, if you're comfortable elevating that left knee off the ground, we'll take it back to downward facing dog. Letting your head dangle and your jaw dangle. If down dog's not comfortable today, you could always drop your knees and do a dropped, like it, it's called puppy dog when we're sort of in a, a, a quarter downward facing dog, maybe on the forearms even. But otherwise, um, if you are in down dog, let's elevate onto the balls of the feet, sitting bones reach high, and then you'll roll forward into plank, which is high, because you have all your tensegrity or body structure, tone, and roll back to downward facing dog. Take any micro movements that might feel good, maybe bending one knee and looking underneath the opposite arm. And then we're gonna roll forward to plank again, dropping the knees into table. Knees come under the hips and then just shaking each arm out. Curl your left toes under again and we're gonna flatten the left foot, pressing down through the right hand and shin to um, spin open into side plank. You might take the um, arm overhead if that feels good or next to your head, which would be an extension of what we did in our warm up. You could always flip your hand, four fingers oppose the thumb, if that would be better for your wrists. This position of the um, hand, also called anthropoid, um, apes and monkeys sort of walk around on the back of the hand. It just engages the back of your arm musculature, your extensors into your back a little more. That's why it feels different. You can briefly elevate the leg to find a balance there, and then we'll release back down onto the hands and knees. A little check-in to see, is my pelvis tilting too far forward? or is it rounding naturally? Can I be more neutral pelvis as the right leg shoots out? And then you'll float up onto the left hand and left foreleg. You could even spin that foreleg back if that gave you better balance. But there's still these muscles down here that attach at the sacrum are um, streaming sort of diagonally to the outer hip and on down to the foot. And then brief balance, go ahead and lift. Coming up onto the knees once again. We'll shift into the right knee briefly and then step the left foot forward. And then find midline again. And then here's your pelvic bowl. It's gonna glide forward so that now you can press your thigh away. Typically, just like in sitting, we often leave the pelvic bowl behind and then, I don't know if you can see that, um, make this artificial arching of the middle back to 
to then take the arms up or forward, but we need this to support all the way from that back foreleg. And then we'll twist towards this leg, framing the leg bone, inviting the whole rib cage, oops, <laughs> to turn. Head is still floating on top of the spine. And then from here, we'll cartwheel the hands down, 10 finger tops meet the ground, finding a full lunge. <clears throat> Slide this left leg back to plank pose. Inhale and plank, and then we'll exhale back to down dog. Letting the head dangle and the jaw release. And if you find your upper arms turning towards your head, see if you can, um, Widen your shoulders, dropping the elbows wide. And it's almost like they go under. It's external rotation of the upper arm. And then we'll arrive on the knees, coming up, shifting briefly into the left knee so the right leg can come forward. It swings from the hip joint here in the front. And then we'll move this whole pelvic bowl forward so that you can push that right thigh away or whatever side you're on. And then we'll frame this leg into a twist, twisting away from you here. But all this is supporting the twist. Renew that head on the spine. And then 10 finger tops will find the ground and we'll come um, up into lunge and then spring off that back foot forward fold. You can land with bent knees if that's better for you. And then we'll float or roll up to stand <clears throat> in mountain pose at the front of your mat. So find a little weight in the heels if you can. The pelvis sort of nods yes in the back without tucking under. So there's a, this drop that I was speaking of and then the head is free to nod forward. They counterbalance each other. Hands me at the heart. <clears throat> Let's um, remember our intention briefly. Holding that in, holding that in our thoughts and then we're, we're gonna bend the knees slightly and like that drawbridge we did on our knees, you're gonna send the hips back, head forward, chair pose, um, modification of chair pose, but notice that the shins are perpendicular to the ground. So that requires some freedom in the foot and ankle bone. Um, and then we'll press into the feet, rising up, bending the knees, shifting the hips back, this time dropping from the hip joints in the front and forward fold. Right foot steps back into lunge, left leg follows to downward facing dog or any modification you wanna do. We'll roll forward to plank, drop your knees, this time glide back and then glide forward to shoot all the way through onto your belly. <clears throat> so the push up is, um, supported by the pelvis once again, the sitting bones. This time inhale through baby cobra if you'd like, or um, just stay low, pressing into your forearms for a little sphinx or modified cobra. And then we'll go back to down dog or child's pose to rest. From child's pose or down dog, you're gonna step your right foot forward, drop the back knee and just briefly come up again. <clears throat> this time we'll trace this musculature from back here, up the sides of the ribs and arms will extend all the way up, getting their support from this wrap of the back and the extensors. Arms just float down to the ground and then we'll uh, float up to forward fold. 
Releasing the head. <clears throat> Inhale, float the arms up and overhead. Exhale, hands to the heart. We'll go again. We'll bend the knees, sweep the hips back, forward fold. Left leg extends back or steps back into lunge and the right leg follows to down dog. Inhale, come forward to plank. Drop your knees and glide back to shoot forward and down. The forward part is what we usually miss. We usually just go straight down in the push up, but we need to bob the head, the whole spinal column forward. Um, and then you can stay low or <clears throat> come up higher to a back bend of your choice. The tops of the feet are snug to the ground and there's still a little bit of engagement down the back line of the leg here. And then we'll take it back to down dog or child's pose once again to rest. Rest and it's like an active pause for you to notice yourself, notice your intention. When you're ready, um, from table, the left foot can step forward. If you're in down dog, the left leg will swing from the hip socket and then the leg and that pelvic calf will come forward. Lunge, we'll drop the back knee again, rising up. Swing forward and down, and then you can just activate. It's almost like a V shape from your sacrum all the way up to your hands but the front foot is still pushing the ground. So the arms and shoulders are supplied the lower limbs and pelvis. Good, and then we'll release, finding this lunge, bouncing forward, forward fold. Inhale, trace the center line, arms rise high. Exhale, hands to the heart. Let's shift back now to the back of your mat. I have to just think about it. So we're gonna be in mountain pose. Um, I'm not gonna mirror you. I'll just let you focus on your own directions on your mat. Um, we're gonna pivot the left foot out at a 45 degree angle. And then the right foot is gonna step. So that's in the left lane or whichever side you're doing, but my left foot is in the left lane. Right foot is gonna step forward in the right lane. So they're gonna keep their lanes. And then you might step it forward two steps, three steps. We're eventually going um, wherever you land, however long you choose to be. The knee is gonna be over the ankle and not forward of it. And I went from hips facing the front, the narrow end of the mat to now spinning open just a little bit there. So it's a little bit of warrior one and warrior two mixed together. Um, but now I'm gonna pick up that V shape from my sacrum all the way. It's like you wanna float your right arm forward. It almost feels like swimming, like swimming, uh, shooting off into the water. I'm gonna turn around so you can see that on the other side. So it's the same thing we've been talking about the whole time, that the arm is extending here because it has all this support from this musculature. Um, which is a different, it's a spiral. It's a different feeling than if, um, I don't want you to do the other thing, <laughs> but if you just reach your arm out with no support, it, it feels very different. Um, I'll come back to being with you on this side. Um, you can just, you've already been holding this for a little while, so let's take a little break. Letting your head and eyes move freely. And we'll just come right back into that. And then you can choose, if you'd like, to drop the forearm down and extend the top arm into a little bit of a modified side angle. We're sort of, again, um, in between warrior one and warrior two legs.
And then the front foot pushes the ground away to bring you up. And we'll release that side. And then when you work with the other side, the foot that's not stepping forward pivots out 45 degrees. And then the other foot steps forward one, two or three steps so that you can feel the spin. So just if you look at the fascial lines in the body, you know, we talk about separate muscles and separate parts of the body, but everything is sort of one continuous, um, everything is connected to everything else. And this pose makes, reminds me of that. And then we'll take a little break. <clears throat> and either repeat the same pose or turn it into a little modified side angle where your heart might be facing the ground more than traditionally we open all the way up to the wall in front of us, but we're still trying to keep <laughs> everything that we worked on earlier throughout class. So. Um, and then that spiral just sort of spins you all the way around back onto your knees. And you're welcome to take that quarter dog here. Maybe you'd like to rest on your belly for a few moments. Or uh, some people enjoy resting in something more active like down dog. So I'll just give you a few moments just to do your own thing, um, resting or in activity. Uh, and then we're gonna meet in a standing <clears throat> position to just do a little bit of a balancing pose when you're ready. I'm gonna just get my water. <clears throat> so let's um, stand with the feet just slightly wider than hip width apart. <clears throat> you could even turn the toes out a little bit if that felt good for you. Keeping the shoulders wide as they sort of emanate where the collarbones end. Um, let's just allow the arms to crisscross in front of each other. They can take turns. And then we're going to, just like we bounced from sitting bone to sitting bone in our seated position earlier, for our balancing pose, we're gonna, you could actually start smaller if you wanted to. That'd be better for you. Where it depends on your balance. Um, where we shift to one <clears throat> side, one foot, and then the other. So I'll show. It starts out sort of subtle, where my foot bones and my ankles are just changing shape. Um, sometimes when we're doing this pose for the first time, our feet and ankles lock, and then we try to move something higher to shift from side to side. But it's really a shift way down there. Um, and then I was, the way I started you was that you could be wider. So ball heel. It's hard to show you on, in this format. Um, it's, it's the same thing that we had on our back earlier where we were rolling with weight from one side to the other. That's the same thing that's happening here. I'm transferring my weight down into the standing leg. To, and then the other one just happens to come up off the ground. That's different than being like a little braced and tense and trying to pick myself up to come over like with force or upward pull. Um, so see if you can just play with that. Um, if balance is an issue for you, then playing with this at a very you know, ground level here. I'm not even really leaving the ground. It's just weight shift from one side to the other. Um, if it feels like it's going well, your arms could sort of mirror what your legs are doing. And um, like a little windmill or something, you could start to play with balancing 
laterally here. But it's just that standing leg is strong to support the other three limbs. Strong and going down. Mm -hmm. Play with different. <clears throat> But see, see what appeals to you today as you just play around for a moment or two <clears throat> with your balance. And then you'll go back. Eventually, you'll just land on two feet again and maybe walk around your space just to find the cadence of being, the rhythm of being on two legs again and just how that works. Um, and then let's <clears throat> let's go ahead and briefly come back to our seated position. Um, and so usually when we sit down this low on the ground, like I feel my pelvis sort of tucking under a little bit. So I'm going to pick up my pelvis and really shoot my sitting bones a little further back so that when I sit up, my pelvic bowl is just sitting in neutral, it's not tucked under, which would mean it's tilting backwards. Um, yeah, so see if now you um, bring your heels or your feet to the wide in front of you. And we're gonna, arms are on the inside of the legs and we're gonna hold the shins, the ankles or the shins, whatever would be good for you. I'm just going to pivot a little bit this way so you have a better view. So my sitting bones are grounded and that's part of what's giving me my uprightness, but then like a tensegrity structure where everything supports each other. My feet, my legs and feet are releasing forward, but my hands are hanging back. They're holding the shin so that I can hang back. My lengthening my arms, keeping that width. It's like this self-supporting circuit here. So you could stay here. If you wanted to play with a little twist here, we'll do blossoming lotus twist. Left hand stays as it is. And then it's like you're tossing a Frisbee with your right arm and then the fingers just release finally. But <clears throat> it's your rib cage that's opening underneath that to support you. Because this other hand has a strong connection, we just sort of want to hang back a little bit without strain, like trying to pull forward through the head, neck, or shoulders. Um, and then we can switch sides. If, if twisting isn't good for you, you can just hang out here, just hanging back in your width. <clears throat> and we'll release. And then um, extending the legs long, if, if that's comfortable for you, you could also do one at a time. Wide leg, forward fold and ready for, and again, the, uh, the pelvic bowl is tipping forward from the sitting bones in order to give you some forward movement into this pose. But some of us, the pelvic bowl, it doesn't want to tip forward because there's some tightness there. So you could put your hands behind you and just be with opening out through the legs. If you're doing the half version, um, I would just switch which knee is bent somewhere in the middle here. So we'll just hold for a few, for a little bit here. And then everyone's different. Um, sometimes relaxing the tops of your feet can help all these connections feel more settled. Sometimes pushing the heel bones out, almost flexing at the ankle makes you feel more connected through the legs. So just sometimes there's a little pressure on the knees. So, so I'm giving you these different foot options just to notice what's true there. And then if you are folded forward, see if you can just start to look out 
along the floorboard down to the room and your pelvis is gonna right itself. So the sacrum sort of plunks back into place and that's for everything above it to come up. Let's scoop under the knees. And just take a moment maybe to hug your knees or round a little bit. Let's um, bring the legs into a diamond shape. Just reorganize your pelvis again. And then from here, the feet don't have to touch each other. Um, we're gonna think of the sternum and this costal arch of the ribs just sort of collapsing a little bit into a deliberate rounding, um, like a child's pose almost. And then you might pivot forward from your hips. So you're really trying to plump up the spine in the back here, especially in the middle spine. Beetle curve or child's pose. Let your arms just release into your legs. And then from here, slowly begin, like you're a turtle in its shell, slowly begin to be curious about what's out there. So your eyes might glance up at your toes first. And then you'll look further and further on the floor in front of you until your spine grows and becomes diagonal now. It's no longer rounded. And so we started with the primary curve of the spine, this round curve that all babies have. And then as we looked out to become diagonal, the low back curve and the neck curve have been restored. So now we have this whole head to pelvis length that we talked about earlier and we're just gonna roll open, roll on the sitting bones to come back up. And so hopefully that just refresh that spinal fountain. Draw the knees together and um, go ahead and return onto your back now. And you may not need anything under your head at this point, things may have lengthened. Um, Sometimes a small something under the head is nice. And then just take a moment to give yourself enough space to be on your back, let things settle again. We'll press into the feet and <clears throat> glide up briefly into a bridge. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, let the spine release back down. Drawing the knees towards you. And you might scissor the knees. Or um, circle the knees. You could figure eight with the legs, just any little motion or go back to the side to side rolling. That might be different now. You might be more available to release to the ground. Um, just winding it down here. <clears throat> Being curious about your intention or how your <clears throat> body, pardon me, <clears throat> how your body is responding to this portion, uh, to the practice at this point. You might hear a little gurgling in your belly, which is the parasympathetic nervous system kicking in a little more. Um, Noticing and winding it down. And we're going to um, transition now to final relaxation. So you're welcome to put something under your knees if that would be supportive for your back, maybe rolling up a blanket, putting some cushions under there. <clears throat> um, 
taking yourself, the arms and legs long and wide. Some people enjoy joining the soles of the feet together, maybe putting a block underneath each knee <clears throat> and then holding on to opposite elbows overhead. That's a way of being more self-contained. Let's see what resonates with you. And we'll take a couple minutes in final relaxation so that you can enjoy all the benefits of the practice, letting the nervous system in particular have a sense of deep rest and safety. <clears throat> um, if you're watching the recording, you're welcome to pause and take a longer final relaxation. I will ring the bell though when it's time to close the practice. I hope you enjoy this time for yourself. And begin to deepen your breath, inviting some movement and awareness to travel through your body. Becoming aware of the space around you, and the spaciousness within you. You might choose to stay as you are, or if you'd like to, you can um, pivot up to a seated position. Just take a moment to close the practice here. Honoring your intention. And as you leave the mat, I hope you take with you the benefits of the practice, including a greater sense of ease, integration, and well-being. Namaste. Namaste.